Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We welcome all who have <coughs> come to worship with us, and our service has been led by Alan. Thank you, Alan, and thank you, Jason. Tomorrow, Monday, brigade meet at six o'clock, but the elders meet before brigade at four p.m. Wednesday, coffee and chat on Zoom from ten thirty to eleven <coughs> thirty. Thursday, tea, toast, and talk and a warm space from 10 until 12. <laughs> Next Sunday, the 10th of December, at 10.45, worship will be led by Reverend Liz Adams, and we will be back in the sanctuary for the rest of December services. First is this week, Hilly Everson Watts and Lisa Jenkins, and we wish them both a very happy birthday. <coughs> Also, I've been asked to draw your attention to the Cantari Singers Christmas Concert at Bethany Homestead in the chapel. This is on Thursday the 14th of December at 2 p.m. And tickets are £6 and they're available <coughs> on reception from the 13th of November. So I'll put the poster back up on the board. Thank you. <coughs> Prepare the way of the Lord. He is a coming. He's coming soon. It was wonderful to hear you all singing while we were waiting out in, in the ministry. Of course, it's a very special day today. It's the first Sunday in Advent. Musically, it's my favourite season. But perhaps the first Sunday is a little too early for singing Christmas carols. No? Well, well some of them are a bit... But there, there, there's some wonderful Advent hymns and we're going to sing a few today. But our call to worship. As we gather in hopeful expectation, light of the world, make us ready. As we seek your transforming presence, day spring from on high, renew us. As we bring to you our griefs and fears, God of all comfort, lighten our darkness. As we offer you our prayers and praise, bright morning star, fill us with your glory. Amen. And now we're going to sing a very traditional hymn for our first Sunday in Advent. Hark the glad sound, the Saviour comes, the Saviour promised long. Advent wreath here, and 
it's rather traditional for the youngest person here to light the first candle. So Max has agreed that he's going to come out and with a bit of bit of assistance, he's going to light the candle. Well done, Max. Shall I shall I hold it for you? You hold it, and then I'll I'll press the button. All right. Ready? So we wait in hope for God to come again, to enlighten our world, reveal our dark places and teach us to be his light in our darkness. And as we light this candle, may our hope be renewed that Christ will be born again in our lives this Christmas time. So it's four weeks until Christmas. <coughs> Thanks very much, Max. Take a seat. Well done. So let us pray. Eternal God, through long generations you prepared a way in our world for the coming of your Son. And by your Spirit you are still bringing the light of the Gospel to darkened lives. Renew us, so that we may welcome Jesus Christ to rule our thoughts and claim our love as Lord of Lords and King of Kings, to whom be glory always. Amen. In this advent of expectation, draw us together in unity, that our praise and worship might echo in these walls and also through our lives. In this advent of expectation, draw us together in mission, that the hope within might be the song we sing and the melody of our lives. In this advent of expectation, Draw us together in service, that the path we follow might lead us from a stable to a glimpse of eternity. God of hope, who brought love into this world, be the love that dwells between <coughs> us. God of hope, who brought peace into this world, be the peace that dwells with us. God of hope, who brought joy into this world, be the joy that dwells within us. God of hope, the rock we stand upon, be the centre, the focus of our lives always, and particularly this Advent time. Forgive us, Lord. We are a wandering people who come before you now, a people who bring prayers and requests to your feet, when we have need of you and nowhere else to turn. Then go our own way when times are good and life is easy. Forgive us and draw us close. Teach us your way that we might follow. Help us to walk in your company and know your presence from the moment we awake until we lay our heads to rest. Amen. And we say together the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. <coughs> Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We stick with the traditional as we sing again. And um, I've, I've, I've re-recorded this one this year. We haven't done it for a few years, but I think I got it a bit wrong before and everybody was singing in the right... Well, everybody was singing in the right places, I was singing in the wrong places. So, um, it's difficult because the music says freely, which means it isn't in a sort of a strict time signature. 
which is a bit difficult when you've got an electronic keyboard to play it. So, that aside, we are going to sing, properly hopefully this time, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Jacob, 
whose hope is in the Lord their God. He is the maker of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them. He remains faithful forever. He upholds the cause of the oppressed and gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets prisoners free. The Lord gives sight to the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the foreigner and sustains the fatherless and the widow, but he frustrates the ways of the wicked. The Lord reigns forever, your God, O Zion, for all generations. Praise the Lord. Thanks be to God. We're now sing one of my favourites, which has come to be sort of known as a, as a Christmas one, but it's, it's really an Advent hymn. Uh, Let all the earth hear his voice. like a leaf, and 
like the wind, our sins sweep us away. No one calls on your name or strives to lay hold of you. You have hidden your face from us and have given us over to our sins. Yet you, Lord, are our Father. You are the clay. You are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. Do not be angry beyond measure, Lord. Do not remember our sins forever. Oh, look on us, we pray, for we are all your people. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Jim. Elsewhere in Isaiah and in Micah, um, it's been spoken of God's people coming together at the coming of the Messiah and streaming to the hills where the temple is. So we're now going to sing another hymn of praise which reflects those, those thoughts in the Advent, Advent hymn, Hills of the North Rejoice. away from the temple, one of his disciples said, Teacher, look at that stonework, those buildings. Jesus said, You're impressed by this grandiose architecture? There's not a stone in the whole work that is not going to end up in a heap of rubble. Later, as he was sitting on Mount of Olives in full view of the temple, Peter, <coughs> James, John and Andrew got him up by himself and asked, Tell us, when is this going to happen? What sign will we get that things are coming to a head? Jesus began, Watch out for doomsday deceivers. Many leaders are going to show up with forged identities, claiming I'm the one. They will deceive a lot of people. 
when you hear of wars and rumoured wars, keep your head and don't panic. This is routine history and no sign of the end. Nation will fight nation and ruler fight ruler over and over. Earthquakes will occur in various places. There will be famines. But these things are nothing compared to what's coming. Following those hard times, sun will fade out, moon cloud over, stars fall out of the sky, cosmic powers tremble. And then they'll see the Son of Man enter in grand style, his arrival filling the sky. No one will miss it. He'll dispatch the angels. They will pull in the chosen from the four winds, from pole to pole. Take a lesson from the fig tree. From the moment you notice its buds form, the merest hint of green, you know summer is just around the corner. And so it is with you. When you see all these things, you know he is at the door. Don't take this lightly. I'm not just saying this for some future generation, but for this one too. These things will happen. Sky and earth will wear out, but my words won't wear out. But the exact day and hour? No one knows that. Not even heaven's angels, not even the Son, only the Father. So keep a sharp lookout, for you don't know the timetable. It's like a man who takes a trip, leaving home and putting his servants in charge, each assigned a task, and commanding the gatekeeper to stand watch. So stay at your post, watching. You have no idea when the homeowner is returning, whether evening, midnight, cockcrow or morning. You don't want him to show up unannounced, with you asleep on the job. I say it to you, and I, I'm saying it to all. Stay at your post. Keep watch. Thanks be to God. Now the next hymn is one that was suggested for today, although it doesn't appear in any of our hymn books. And doing a bit of research on hymnary.org, I discovered that the usual tune that it's set to is very similar to Old King Cole. <laughs> but, after, but, but after the talk about the Ugly Duckling last week, I've decided to set it to How Sweet the Name of Jesus Sounds. So you'll have no problem picking up The King Shall Come When Morning Dawns.
When Kate and I retired, we were given the wonderful gift of the membership of English Heritage and later the National Trust. We've continued our membership of the National Trust to this day and have many memorable visits to places of historic interest, including castles, stately homes, parks, gardens and monuments. It's surprising how many of these old buildings and estates are statements and expressions of their owners' faith, particularly those who lived at the time of the oppression of the Catholic Church. It's interesting to wonder whether those who built some of these magnificent structures would expect them to stand as long as they have, that we would still be able to visit them today and into the future. Now, having visited Corfe Castle on Friday, I'll do a little publicity piece for the National Trust now and quote their slogan, For everyone, forever. And they do a very nice coffee and cake too. We do, however, often have a bit of a journey to visit our chosen attractions, as there are very few sites of note locally. Those of you who follow Northampton history on social media will know what I'm talking about when you see pictures posted of old buildings of the town which are no longer standing. There is a, there invariably an outcry in the comments of how could they have demolished such a beautiful old building? And then someone would be blaming someone unfairly for knocking it down, usually pointing a finger at the council. You too may have a personal affection for some of these no longer standing architectural wonders. More often than not, it's the new theatre, or Notre Dame School, or the Emporium Arcade, so what has this little bit of local history got to do with today's Gospel reading? Well, the story is set in Jerusalem, near the time of Jesus' crucifixion. Jesus and his disciples were leaving the temple, one of the most magnificent structures in biblical times. The disciples couldn't help but marvel at its majesty. The temple had been torn down twice in the past, by invading armies. King Herod undertook the rebuilding, expansion and glorious decoration of the temple at about the time of Jesus' birth. It was completed about the time of today's reading from Mark. It was acknowledged as one of the most beautiful building complexes in the entire world. There were gates and arches, tunnels and stairways, the stones were gleaming white with extensive gold overlay. The outside was decorated with marble walls and columns. The eastern side of the temple was plated with gold and the ten gates into the temple were covered in gold or silver. It must have been quite a sight as the gleaming white marble and stunning metalwork flashed in the Middle Eastern sun. For the people of Jerusalem, the temple was a sign of the glory that would return to Israel. The disciples were obviously impressed and overawed at the sight of this remarkable building. So what Jesus said almost amounted to sacrilege. Destroyed? What a thing to say. This magnificent house of God would be destroyed. They must have thought it would stand forever. This was unthinkable. Imagine what an outcry there would have been on social media if they'd had it. If that's not bad enough, Jesus goes on to talk about the end of all things. The whole of chapter 13 of Mark's Gospel contains all kinds of signs that would indicate when the end is near. He warned about times when the followers of Jesus would be persecuted and brought before judges and kings. Family members will turn against each other. He told of unnatural things happening in the heavens. The sun won't shine, the moon will go dark, the stars will fall from the sky, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Peter, who was there that day, admiring the temple, later spoke of the day to come in his second letter, saying, be prepared, he will come like a thief in the night. Paul also uses this in his first letter to the Thessalonians, 
as does Matthew in his Gospel. The imagery of a thief in the night is very familiar. But somewhere along the line, I must have missed the Mark version, where the person who returns when least expected is the master of the house, having left the house in the charge of his servants. This seems to make the message a lot clearer. And the implication is very similar to the parable of the talents, which we heard two weeks ago. We have seen a lot of those predictions come true. There have been wars and earthquakes, natural disasters of all kinds, floods, famines, droughts, <coughs> storms, tsunamis, you name it. It's obvious that there is still more to come. Christians have been persecuted, and these will continue to happen. In fact, if we take seriously all of the predictions of the Bible about the end of the world, we are left with a terrifying picture of the coming of the day of God, which will cause the burning heavens to be dissolved and the elements to melt with fervent heat, as Peter says. It would seem that everything solid, even something as solid as the temple, Every human relationship, even the people close to us in our families, everything that we put our trust in, everything that we love in this life, everything that we thought would go on forever, will all be suddenly wiped away when that day finally comes. The disciples thought that the temple would stand forever, but it would be just a few short years later that the Romans would strip the temple of all its precious metals and tear it down, stone by stone never to be rebuilt again. It's scary, isn't it? Things that we think are so permanent in our lives, in actual fact, are only temporary. It's hard to imagine what life would be like without those things and those people that give us a sense of security and permanency. The things we own, our wealth, our accomplishments, all the things we think are important, really, are very temporary. In a moment, they can be taken away and the rug is pulled out from under us. We discover that the things that we thought were solid and important are not the things that we can really rely on. So we might find that faith in Jesus and the assurance, comfort and hope that he offers is all that matters. The promises of Jesus that we've heard a thousand times before suddenly take on a new meaning and importance as all the other things that we once thought important are relegated to the sidelines. Our God and his promises of love, strength to endure and the joy of eternal life in the end are all that we need. This is what Jesus is really getting at when he says there will not be left here one stone <coughs> on which will not be thrown down. As wonderful as the successes and the things of this life are, they are not permanent. And we are so easily led by the lie that the things of this world are so important and that we could never exist without them. Just think for a moment of a third world country where there are no widescreen TVs, electronic gadgets, there's not even electricity and clean water. Yet the people are still happy, even though there are so many uncertainties in their lives. They don't need these things to be happy. I'm not saying we shouldn't be grateful for the pleasures and joys that we have, but we need to be careful that being happy and contented does not depend on these things. Paul talked about being content and satisfied at all times, no matter whether he was in need or had enough. What gave him true contentment was knowing Jesus and his love, and with that he could face all kinds of conditions. He said this, and you may recognise it as the basis of the song, All I Once Held Dear. Yes, all the things I once thought were so important are gone from my life, compared to the high privilege of knowing Christ Jesus as my Master. First hand, everything I once thought I had going for me is insignificant. 
when Jesus talks about what will happen in the future, I'm sure that he's not telling us horror stories to frighten us. He's simply pointing out what we so easily forget. Our journey through life in this world is short, and our true wealth is knowing Jesus' love and care for each of us. The words that have been written are to reassure us that in the end, what is important is not so much what is coming, but who is coming. Jesus says, Then the Son of Man will send out his angels and will gather together his chosen ones from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the sky. Much like the words of Hills of the North Rejoice, which we sang earlier. This fulfills the promise that Jesus made. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will receive you to myself, that where I am, you may be there also. Jesus will return. He is our loving Saviour. Those whom he loves and those who trust, who trust in him have nothing to fear during the last days, when everything is in chaos. Not even the idea of the last judgment can fill us with fear when we know that all our sins have been washed away. But I ask again, when will that time be? These words were written at a time when the events of the Gospels were still recent history. When people, or people who knew people with first-hand accounts of Jesus' life, death and resurrection, were still alive. They must have believed that the coming time for Jesus to return was imminent. But the wait got longer and longer. With the benefit of 2,000 years of hindsight, it may be easy now to think that the time will never come. That we have all the time in the world to do just as we please. Alternatively, we may wish that with things that are happening in the world today, God would get his finger out and Jesus will return soon to give that ultimate happy ending for all those who call him Saviour and Lord by sorting out all of the world's problems. So here's a thought. Just maybe we have a long time to wait too. And while we are waiting, maybe we should be working hard to get the world ready for his return. That may seem like an impossible task, but a few weeks ago I saw a meme on Facebook which made me think <coughs> it was referring to time travel movies like Back to the Future. You know what happens in those. Someone goes back to a time in the past and they do one small act which has a huge impact on the present when they return to it. So here's a thought. We should never underestimate that a small change we make now could have a huge impact in the future. Since its earliest days, the Church has proclaimed that Christ will come again. In times of despair, doubt and despondency, God's people have hoped Christ will come again. Yet we've been waiting a long time. Advent after Advent we proclaim Christ will come again. Yet at the same time we've learned to live with views of power and glory where grace is costly and God is at work on the margins with the weak and despised. If Christ does come again, we'll see him at work on the edge, with the poor and the least, showing us how to live and love with hope, despite God's silence. <coughs> Maybe only when we've learnt how to live as Jesus taught, will Christ come again. Amen. So you might think this next hymn is a Christmas hymn. After all, it's called Rumours of Angels. If you can get past the first verse, you'll find it's very much 
about the second coming. So we're now going to sing Rumours of Angels. and sing a verse or two of that one again.
These are words of St. Teresa of Avila. Christ has no body but yours. No hands, no feet on earth but yours. Yours are the eyes with which he looks. Yours are the feet with which he walks to do good. Yours are the hands with which he blesses all the world. Great God, we give you our thanks and praise and recognise all you have given us. Bless these gifts. Inspire us to use them wisely in the service of your coming kingdom. Amen. Amen. And now our prayers of intercession. And there's a response to these prayers. So at the end of each prayer I will say, Come Lord Jesus. And please respond with the words, Come and inspire us anew. Come Lord Jesus. Come and inspire us anew. <clears throat> Risen Lord Jesus, long expected, with us in our hearts, yet hidden from view. From view. We ponder your words anew this Advent, as we long for our world to be made right. We weep over the wars of our world, remembering the people of Ukraine, Palestine and Yemen in particular. Inspire those working for peace and justice with your love, wit and wisdom. Come Lord Jesus, come and inspire us in you. We yearn for your world to be different, for the hungry to be fed, the poor lifted up, for justice to flow like a mighty river, for a levelling up of the have and have nots. Yet we live in the world as it is, where might is right and power is valorised. Teach us quickly, O Lord, how to turn away from our power and embrace your weakness found on the edge with the destitute and downtrodden. Come, Lord Jesus, come and inspire us anew. We long for our world and our nation to be better governed. We pray for those who hold or seek elected office, that they may be honest, act with integrity, always seeking the welfare of both creation and the poor. We pray for our nations in a long approach to a general election, that we may vote wisely and hold our political leaders to account, as all one day will have to give account to the King of Kings. Come Lord Jesus, come and inspire us in you. We pray for the sick and the suffering, remembering before you those who particularly need our prayers and to know your precious love and healing. Lord, you know all, the, all those who need your, need your prayers and need your love. And we think of them in a moment's silence. We ask these prayers in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> and we come to our final hymn, and we'll sing, Light has dawned that ever may blaze, darkness flees away.
May the creator of the stars of night comfort you as you seek to shine in the gloom. May the redeemer of the world inspire you to find him on the edge with the poor and forsaken. May the eternal flame of divine love inspire you to search for and search for and proclaim the coming kingdom even when things seem bleak. And may the blessing of Almighty Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with you and all whom you love, now and always. Amen. Amen. And we'll say together, Grace to one Grace to Grace to Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be with us all, evermore. Amen. Amen.